Welcome. Thank you so much for joining the World Affairs Council of Connecticut this evening uh, for a very special young professionals discussion uh, on defense against the dark arts in space with Caitlin Johnson, deputy director and fellow for the Aerospace Security Project at the Center for Strategic and in International Studies. Uh, we are going to have our conversation moderated this evening by Caroline Schaefer, a uh, virtual communication specialist here at the World Affairs Council. Uh, and you're in for a really great discussion tonight. My name is Amanda Jolly, VP of Programs at the Council. I'm pleased to turn it over to you, Caroline. Caroline Schaefer, virtual communication specialist and moderator of this evening's conversation. Thank you, Amanda, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. And of course, a special uh, thank you for joining us to Caitlin Johnson. Welcome. We're so happy to have you. Excited to so, be here. <laughs> I want to start off by just saying this event and the name of it is based off of a report recently released by CSIS called Defense Against the Dark Arts in Space. Um, I promise that's where the Harry Potter theme came from. So if you guys haven't checked that out, you should definitely check it out, as well as the recently released, as of last week, uh, Space Threat Assessment. So both of those are great resources. But I just want to start off by asking, Kaylin, can you set the scene for us? Why did you and your co-authors feel the need to write this report, and why now? So hi, everybody. My name is Caitlin Johnson. I specifically focus on um, space policy research, um, specifically with the uh, national security focus and the US lens. Um, we at the Aerospace Security Project have been writing an assessment for the past four years called the Space Threat Assessment, where we track down any publicly available information about counter space weapons. So weapons that are designed to impact, uh, degrade, destroy space systems. The first year we did it, we had a lot of kickback from especially people in the military or the intelligence community saying that all this research is classified, there's no way we'll find anything. I like to think we proved them wrong in a big way. We have four iterative reports, all with new information. And so once we convinced our peers that this information was out there and that we could have a public conversation about threats to our space systems. We often then got the, the question from people, especially um, I would say senators and representatives on the Hill. You know, so what do we do about it? I now believe you, these threats are out there. They exist. Uh, countries are testing them. They're investing money and in R&D into these technologies how can we protect our satellites? And I think the challenge here for us that we saw that we needed to fill was that, again, a lot of this information can be classified, but if you can talk about it in a very logical way, often based on the principles of physics and in a way that is you know, shareable in, in the, the broader public community, we can then move on and have this conversation of, of what can the United States do to make sure that we are not vulnerable in space. And there are ways that we can do that. And so that's really what this focus is on, which is why it lined itself up so well with the Harry Potter theme, defense against the dark arts. So the dark arts are those counter space weapons and the defenses are really what we get down to uh, in this report. Yeah, absolutely. One of your goals being to make this kind of digestible for the broader public. I think you absolutely were successful in that. So can you dive in a little bit more to the Harry Potter theme of this report and why you chose this theme? Sure. Um, so I uh, will be the first to admit I'm a huge Harry Potter fan. I do want to say that in the past year, the author JK Rowling has made some really awful comments and views towards the transgender community, and we don't support that at all. We thought that this theme and the, the Harry Potter setting really brought some light and levity to a really serious topic, and we wanted to kind of celebrate that and celebrate the other values that we found in Harry Potter books. And so that is kind of my caveat, um, because I think it is important to note. The Harry Potter theme, I I think I suggested it first to my boss, uh, partially in jest, but it just worked out so well. And he was reading the books with his kids at the time and for the first time. Um, and so he really leaned in hard to it. And we have this incredible team that we work with who produces all of our um, reports. And so our amazing designer, Emily, really leaned into this daily profit theme for the look and feel of the report and created 
um, icons and crests and really linked uh, the ideas we had um, about bringing the theme in. And I, and I think a, a still professional way, but in a way that maybe makes this really uh, complicated and really serious topic a little more um, easy to digest, especially for people who don't spend the day thinking about uh, space weapons. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can attest to the fact because I feel like I have a good baseline on, you know, counter space weapons and our defense systems. And I, I did not have a background prior. So uh, thank you for that. So let's kind of dive right into these more technical terms. Um, can you please talk to us about the militarization versus the weaponization of space and how those two things are different and if they've already happened? Sure. So we start the report with this chapter, I think, because it's important to set the scene. This was really written for a public audience, an audience like staffers on the Hill who don't focus on space all the time. Um, and so we thought that this chapter was particularly important to showcase that space has been militarized uh, since the beginning. And by that, we mean it has always been used for military purposes. So the first satellites launched into space were by the Soviet Union and the US military organizations. They have been used since then for you know, military communications, for precision guided munitions, for GPS and targeting, um, to keep our nuclear weapons communications running so that the president at any time, any place could make that command if uh, President Biden has to. And so we just at the outset wanted to express that, that these terms often get confused. And what we're really focusing on is the weaponization of space. So when we look at how to define space weapons um, in the international community, there's a lot of debate. Is this a weapon that affects a space system? Is it a weapon that is placed in space and then is directed at Earth? Is it a weapon that is in space and only used against other space uh, assets, other satellites orbiting. Our framework encompasses all of it. Anything that affects um, a, a space system in some way, which could include attacks on ground stations. So there are a lot of radars um, and ground communication stations all over the world that help command and control and communicate with satellites. And so we consider, you know, even a, a, an attack on that base or that facility could be a counter space attack. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, and then with that, I want to shift gears into the actual threat and defense frameworks that you guys talk about and you cover in this report. But first, let's kind of just unpack why the everyday civilian should care about this stuff. Because as we've already covered, the report was written in a way that, you know, anyone can digest it. But, you know, if you're not in the aerospace industry or in a, at a think tank or at NASA, for instance, how can, you know, why should the actuaries, the nurses, the market researchers, just their, your everyday people care about this topic and how does it, how might it impact them each day? Sure, I think for us, when we look at how space impacts our daily life, you, it impacts you without you even knowing it. Um, some things are very obvious, right? So you have uh, satellite communications or satellite TV, direct TV, for example. Um, you have the watching, you know, NASA or SpaceX launch astronauts to the International Space Station, super cool. The ISS itself has been orbiting for over 20 years. There are kids today who have not lived a day in their life without having uh, people living and working in space, which is just incredible. But there are smaller, more invisible ways that space touches us. It, um, our ATMs, for example, are are reliant on the GPS system for precision timing. So is Wall Street. Uh, companies use satellite imagery to actually watch, um, for example, the parking lots at malls to see when the heaviest traffic times are um, or how busy certain stores might be. Satellite imagery also can help farmers and they can use um, you know, satellites to monitor crop patterns, monitor waterfall, nutrients in the earth. I mean, it's incredible the amount of um, good that and, and 
data that space can really bring to all, all people in all walks of life. And of course, if you're like me and you just ordered, ordered Uber Eats for dinner, that's how they're going to find your house. That's true. That's true. Well, thank you. Um, and so then, of course, since this is Defense Against the Dark Arts, there is a dark side to all of this, right? So what, you know, the United States and the Soviet Union were originally the like sole players in space. And now there's there's more uh, more countries who have been launching, um, who are active in space at the ISS, like you mentioned, and things like that. So what are the dark arts in space and who practices them? Sure, so the dark arts in space are, as my boss would say, are death eaters. They are countries that would uh, invest in these counter space weapons technologies. And so the dark arts themselves um, are the weapons technologies. We categorize them in four kind of buckets. Uh, the first is called kinetic physical. Um, a kinetic physical anti-satellite weapon or ASAT is, is a term you'll probably hear a lot. Um, is, and that just means anti-satellite. It's, it's kind of a broad term. A kinetic physical is probably the one that people think of most. Um, it's also the biggest and boldest, which is why we sorted it into House Gryffindor. Um, if you look at our report, there's crusts for each of these categories and they are colored and they are colored in very specific ways. But the most prominent one, for example, is a direct ascent ASAT or an, a missile really that's shot from earth and it intercepts a satellite on orbit or it detonates near enough one that it causes kinetic impact with that satellite that, um, destroys it basically. And so this has happened in the past, Russia tested a weapon like this in early 2020, India in 2019, uh, the United States in 2008, and China in 2007, and US and the Soviet Union tested these really extensively throughout the Cold War. Um, so it's, it's not a new technology. It's actually one of the, I would say, almost easiest, because you can kind of convert missile technology into a counter space weapon in this way. Our next category is non-kinetic physical. Um, so these are weapons that have a physical impact on a satellite, but don't actually make kinetic contact almost. It's how I like to think about it. Um, so a great example of this is um, an, uh, an electromagnetic pulse. So I don't know if you guys have seen Ocean's Eleven. It's uh, one of my favorite movies. They let off an EMP in the back of a car and it like wipes out a city block. Uh, for electricity. So think about putting that up in space. Um, and you can do that either through a, a shrunken version of that technology or even um, setting off a nuclear device in space creates an electromagnetic magnetic pulse that would just kill all of the electronics on satellites in the area. And pretty indiscriminately, you couldn't like target just the US's satellite. You would it would be a pretty general effect, which means it could also maybe hit your satellites if you have satellites nearby. The third category um, is electronic. And so that is actually targeting the way space systems receive and send data. And so this is one of the most proliferated or most commonly used counter space weapons. The one I like to talk about most is jamming technology. And this technology is basically when um, a jammer will throw up a bunch of radio frequency signals that are similar to the radio frequency that the satellite uses to communicate and creates a lot of noise. It's like static on those old, on old TVs and it's just, you can't get it out of your head. That is what happens. So if there was, um, oh, a great example is that Russia uses these pretty prolifically and not in zones of conflict. They use them um, for protection of President Putin, for example. So we have seen incidents, uh, incidents of when Putin is traveling um, or at a site, the jam there's jamming in the area which causes everybody's GPS to just go haywire and think that they are multiple miles away from where they are. It's incurred, actually incurred a lot of uh, trouble with Uber and really expensive Ubers, a uh, pretty funny local effect from this weapon. Lastly, we have cyber, which we sorted into House Slytherin because it is the sneakiest um, and the hardest to detect really. Like cyber weapons in other um, areas. So if you have you know, the attack on Sony, the attack um, on the 
US government's uh, OPM, the personnel management system. Um, sometimes you don't know these attacks have happened until the data has been released or until the attacker makes themselves known. And so you can also do this with satellites. Um, and so that is our fourth category of weapons. Okay, awesome. Well, yeah, I think you just confirmed to our audience that some of those those surges in Uber prices might, might not just be because it's too popular at that time. But I want to pull in an audience question about uh, non-state actors, because we've talked about some of those state actors that are using these counter space weapons. But is there an opportunity for non-state actors to get a hold of some of this tech or is it kind of beyond their reach? Um, like, will there be space terrorism? We have found examples of non-state actors using counter space weapons before. I would say they probably can't get a hold of, you know, the big ones, the ones that are extremely high tech, uh, cost a lot of money, like your direct ascent ASAT, your missile that shoots down a satellite directly. However, jamming equipment, um, you can have localized jamming equipment that you can buy or create from, I want to say Radio Shack, but I'm not sure Radio Shack is still in existence. <laughs> That's buy. <laughs> There's definitely not many left. <laughs> um, and use it locally. And so we've, we found a lot of uh, instances of that. For example, um, shipping trucks, uh, truckers, uh, the containers have GPS locators so that the company can track them and make sure that they're on time and make sure that they're not like off in the middle of nowhere doing whatever. And we've seen uses of gangs in Mexico driving alongside trucking company or truckers and letting off jamming equipment so that the companies don't know that something is wrong um, and can't alert the police fast enough for them to then rob the truck. Uh, we've also seen um, more high profile uh, than Mexican gangs, more high profile uh, non-state actors get a hold of some of this uh, tech, counter space technology as well, inserting false signals, taking over some uh, or corrupting some uh, satellite communications, for example. Cyber, I think is a big area for invest like for this because um, the cyber capabilities that it takes to hack a satellite, for example, are pretty similar to how you hack anything else, right? And so it's not like you need specific training just for space cyber. Mm -hmm. um, and so we see a lot of investment um, in us as also the rogue kind of rogue countries like North Korea investing in cyber that could be used for counter space weapons. I want to touch upon the uh, defense systems, how we do defend against the dark arts, so to speak. Could you just give a brief overview of the main differences between passive and active counter space defenses? This chapter, chapter three in the report, if you want to go read it, is really detailed on the different types of defenses, and there are a ton. The way we wanted to try to, try to think about these are in two categories, passive defenses and active defenses. Uh, passive defenses, we think of like a shield and active is more like a sword. Um, if we're sticking with, you know, funky references here. Within the passive defenses, we've categorized them into architectural, which means how do you actually design your architecture of satellites? So often you don't just launch one satellite by itself, you launch several. So how can you purposefully design these satellites to work with each other um, and often to co-share mission the mission so that if one satellite was damaged that the others could perhaps pick up the rest of the mission and um, you wouldn't be you know stuck without GPS or something like that. Then we have technical defenses and so these are more of your kind of hard applicable kind of defenses like um, shielding, um, encrypting a satellite's communications, like you would encrypt your computer, the filtering the and shuttering, so the, the lens cap I talked about earlier so that you won't get dazzled or blinded. So what could you actually put on a satellite to help it give it the best uh, defenses you, you possibly could? And then lastly, operational is how you really use the satellite or how you could replace it if it um, goes out of service. And so you could move satellites, it's called maneuvering. You could build more stealthy satellites. It's not just painting them black, uh, but there are technical ways to do this. You could have um, other types of um, backup systems. Like if one satellite goes out of commission, you could rapidly launch another. Um, and so these are all operational defenses. 
act defense, active defenses are really challenging and there's something that the space community is still grappling with because um, depending on who you're asking, these active defenses could be seen as a defense or maybe an offense. And so we um, have a lot of problems in looking at, especially the space lawyers have a lot of problems with defining these and trying to think about how we could do space arms control, how we can promote best behaviors when you might have um, a jammer on a satellite or a nearby a satellite. So let's say we have a really fancy satellite that we want to protect. And so and to make sure that it can't be targeted by an incoming missile, we want put a jamming piece on it so that the jammer could interrupt the missiles targeting so that that satellite, our fancy satellite could either get away or it'll the missile might totally miss it. Well, that's all great and good from our perspective, from an adversary's perspective, you just put a counter space weapons weapon system on a satellite in orbit, that satellite could possibly go near my satellite and jam it for no reason with no provocation, you know, provocation. So it's definitely some, some trickier conversations happening around active defenses, but we have seen some countries, um, specifically France, for example, talk about investing in um, what they call bodyguard satellites, but satellites that are designed to protect um, high value assets and that might be considered uh, weapons to somebody else. Okay, well, I'm learning a lot already right now in terms of who knew there were there were space lawyers and as well as bodyguard satellites. So <laughs> already there are that's for everything is what I've learned. <laughs> also true. Well, fantastic. As we kind of wrap up, I'm gonna pull in this last question from the audience and Jonathan asks, in your opinion, what is the single greatest threat to U.S. space assets in 2021, which I'm sure is also mentioned in your space threat assessment for, for the year as well? Yeah, so if this is really interesting to you, um, we did just re release this other report, the space threat assessment. We also released this um, amazing interactive timeline on our website. Um, that you can go through and you can filter by the different categories we just talked about. You can look at which countries are developing which weapons, when they test them. It's all of our data from our reports in a really tangible way. And so I would just suggest you go play around with that because it's a lot of fun. Um, what I worry about most is probably cyber would keep me up at night because um, it's really hard for us to detect cyber incidents. Uh, cyber intrusions can kind of, you know, they can sleep and not be activated for a while. We have documented cases of um, cyber intrusions on at least um, NASA and NOAA, the weather um, organization, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. They provide us all of our weather data on their satellites. And so they're not as well protected, but they still are protected. Um, what I see being used the most is jamming, um, being used as President Putin's personal uh, body man, but also um, as uh, in the South China Sea, in Ukraine, um, up in the Arctic. I mean, we all those hot spots you can find kind of counter space weapons in them um, being used or significant GPS uh, outages being reported. And so while that is worrisome, we can do things to protect against it. Cyber is, is much harder. I'm not a cyber expert, so it's a little bit scarier for me as well um, and, and something that I worry about because it's uh, also just translatable from cyber attacks in other domains to cyber attacks in space. Um, and so that's a, a more scary one for me. Okay, well, thank you so much, Caitlin. And unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions. But if you guys, as I've already mentioned, want to read more about, you know, these the dark arts in space, as well as um, way more about the defense systems that are potentially, you know, like applicable to these different threats, definitely check out the report uh, at CSIS. You can see kind of the real world um, versions of the invisibility cloak and some of the other spells that you might remember from Harry Potter. So you can kind of check that out all there. 
Uh, it's great. And thank you so much, Kaylin, for sharing your knowledge with our audience and joining us to kick off our Young Professional series. I'm happy to. And I just say, if you guys have more questions about this that the reports don't answer, I am trying to be good at being on Twitter, which often means a lot of grammar mistakes on my part, but you can tweet at me. Um, I think it's like Caitlin underscore Johnson and the, the it's complicated. The second O in Johnson is a zero, I think, because uh, my name is extremely common. Thank you. Uh, well, we'll make sure that we add it into the chat and everyone can stay connected. Um, just to echo Caroline, thank you so much, Caitlin. This was a fantastic conversation. Caroline, Caitlin, thank you so much.